So uh, yes, I've been in school for too long. <laughs> and uh, I went, worked in the industry, but then I figured, you know what? This is where I belong. And I'm here today, uh, you know, I'm still a student. I learn every day. So what we're going to be discussing today, and I hope it's an interactive session because uh, all of us have different backgrounds and you'll probably identify with, with what I'm going to say in your areas. So we are going to talk about how business analytics uh, can be used to monetize data. So moving data to information, information to insights, insights into action, action into results, and results into money. So pretty much from cradle to grave. You know, back in the 2000s, I used to be uh, a software design engineer at GE Medical Systems. So what did I do? I used to program their uh, imaging and archiving software that they use in all their X-ray, MRI, and ultrasound machines. And that was a big job. You know, you, um, you needed to put so many hours, so much effort, but they considered us a cost, not a value-adding team. And in fact, if you remember around that time in the 2000s, what happened? Jack, you don't probably remember that. <laughs> but uh, it was the uh, you know, end of the market bubble. And the first thing they laid off are people from our team. And so you know, at the time, I decided, you know what, let me get back to my senses and go back uh, to get my MBA and PhD. So at the time, I had already gone back to school. But uh, basically, we were a cost. And the projects were long. We followed the Six Sigma methodology. And so we started with the waterfall model. You probably are um, uh, familiar with it. So you start with uh, requirements. It takes time, uh, design, implementation, testing, verification, and then um, uh, continuous improvement, basically. So it was a long process. Fast forward to today, Jack's generation. We are using agile uh, product development models. Business analysts are at the center of decision making. They contribute, they drive strategy. They drive operational excellence. They drive competitive advantage. They, um, they drive new product development and insights. And they drive money. Why is that? Look at your cars. You're driving and rolling Internet of Things machines. Every time you breathe, every time you click, every time you send an email, every time you make a turn, every time you break, every time you choose a channel, everything is being recorded and stored somewhere. Insurance companies are paying millions of dollars to basically know how to price their premium. And uh, they're, they're buying, you know, you know what um, is the biggest seller of information right now? Who, who do you think it is? GM, out of everything. They're selling cars, of course, that is internally, but they are the biggest sellers. In fact, they are the, um, currently, they are the market leaders in Internet of Things cars. So they are selling to insurance companies, to, bank, to, to banks. They're selling to um, uh, me media companies. So basically, uh, radio stations want to know what you like and at what time you listen to their music. And whether you're a female for, for in your 40s, whether you have kids in the car, they want to know when you listen to that music. They're selling that information to them. So. Let me ask you a question. Do you know how much politicians are paying to figure out if you're listening to country music or hard rock <laughs> in specific counties? Do you, do you know how much money is being paid for that? That is, the, that is the life we are living in. And who can grab all this information? Who can figure out, who can have that agency to understand these industries, business people? As an engineer, I understood what I was doing. But I needed that business acumen to be able to navigate the product development. So yes, business analytics is at the center of marketing. It's at the center of product development. It's at the center of manufacturing. It's at the center of sales. It's everywhere. So being a shameless plug for Pamplin <laughs> and for my students that I love dearly, 
please meet if that works. This is Faison. Faison uh, was our student. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in business information technology. And he stayed one more year. He got a master's. We have the master's in business uh, administration, business analytics, MSP, ABA. Faison was passionate about basketball. He, uh, his, his family are immigrants from Pakistan. And all he could relate with you know, his teammates, he, he basically, he, he got sandwiches, kebab sandwiches, instead of peanut butter sandwich. The only thing that allowed him to basically mingle with his friends is basketball. He loved playing basketball. And he took this passion with him. He didn't change himself when he came to Pamplin. He took this passion, and he, uh, he used his business acumen, and the uh, business analytics skills he got from Pamplin, he combined those two. And he became a basketball operations specialist currently at the Chicago Bulls. And, you know, enjoying his time, living the dream, doing what he likes, and being a great business analyst. Um, so in this model here, what does he do? So we said that business analytics is used in sales marketing. Of course, it's, it's used in product development and manufacturing. But it's also used in HR. You know, something you wouldn't think that it would be used in. So basically, his job consists of prof profiling players. So he uh, studies the characteristic of players, and he chooses the players who fit the best within the organization. He can predict Hall of Famers, mm -hmm. future Hall of Famers, using the characteristics. He can even um, decide or, or help manage the workload of players on the court. All of this with his business analytics ac acumen. So yes, it's really not magical, um, as I'm going to show you some, uh, you know, how things are running really in the background. But, uh, but it is very far-reaching, with very far-reaching implication. If you're in engineering, if you're in manufacturing, if you're a vet med major, you will always use those concepts you will always need those concepts to do what you do and do it better. So it's complementary to Dean Samakast's uh, initial, uh, you know, when he mentioned transdisciplinary knowledge. So yes, you need your knowledge in your discipline, but you also need to know, you, you need to have that transdisciplinarity, you know, to be able to understand a lot of things around you, to be able to build that complete product that customers would pay money for. All right. So, Let's go back to theory, economics theory. So again, I want to emphasize the difference between data and information. You know, data is everywhere. Every time you write a tweet, our president likes tweeting a lot. Every time you like something on Facebook, this is data. But it's not really information. You're not necessarily making sense of it. So information is meaningful data. It's data that is useful to you. And in economics theory, Infonomics is basically the uh, disciplined approach to monetizing data, to get it to the point, as I said, you know, um, from uh, data to information, information into insights, insights into actions, and actions into results that become money. So this whole cycle is infonomics. And believe it or not, we have uh, models basically, actual models, financial models, that put dollar value to data. The first one is the market, uh, the first one is the economic value. So but the bottom line model of, or value of information. Uh, what is the performance value of the information? Less the cost of it, acquiring it, administering it, and, uh, uh, and ap applying it. You know, bottom, bottom line value. The second one is the interesting one, the market value of information. So I, might, I mentioned that GM has become the biggest seller of Internet of Things data, right? So it's all in the packaging. It's all in the packaging. Some data that insurance companies would love to pay for doesn't mean anything to media companies or might not mean anything to um, politicians. So that packaging, so they have the data, right? But the way they package it is relative to that industry and how much that customer would pay for, for that. 
In fact, it's, uh, it's interesting that they're not, you know, they're targeting specific industries, but they're open to new ones as well. So if you're the healthcare industry and you come to GM and you say, you know what? We want to figure out a way to prevent heart attacks while drivers are driving or to, uh, to predict heart attacks before they drive. So uh, they put sensors on the wheels and they might detect high temperature or um, irregular heartbeat or sweating. All of that by just putting some sensors in the car that would help prevent accidents. So yes, it is about money, right? But it's also about municipalities and uh, city planning. So you want to reduce accidents. You know, you want to reduce congestion. All of these uh, things are possible with analyzing data. So market value is with respect to that industry. How much would you pay for this data? You might not pay much for it, but I, I might be interested in it. So it all depends on the industry and on the customer. It's very tailor-made. The loss value of information is basically opportunity cost. What would you lose if you didn't have this information? So yes, Amazon would lose a lot if Walmart would know more about something they didn't know about because they, they are competitors. They're now competing very closely. But Amazon is competing with everybody, you know, pretty much everyone. In fact, their cloud, uh, their cloud is so usable and so great that it's going to be the second generation of healthcare. The um, electronic healthcare record infrastructure will be their cloud probably because it's the most secure so far, you know, th that's available. So any questions about this? Does it make sense? So what do you need to do in your business? It used to be that you needed to spend so much time to figure out how to categorize your data. Well, now you throw it in Hadoop. What's Hadoop? It's you know, uh, a uh, software uh, platform that allows for distributed storage and processing of big data. So basically, you don't know what your data will give you. Just throw it there. Let the, let the, you know, the software figure it out for you. Give you insight. Those, that's exploration. You're exploring insights that are possible from your data. But what you need to do is categorize your uh, information into domains. And choose the domain that matters to you. What are you good at? What's the real value you're bringing to the table? What do you have that others don't have? This is your key core competency. And this is what you can actually package and sell. For GM, it would be car-related information and directions and everything related to that, right? I mean, data and information you can get from uh, the car, the driver, and what they do in the car. Imagine what we do in our cars, the things we do. What do we not do? I have a closet in my car because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time, you know, when I travel to change. So yes, we do a lot of things in our cars. And imagine the information they're gathering about us. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the, you know, you asked me, so why would I accept to opt in? Because you still have to opt in, right? To the, that internet and of things environment. I mean, for privacy reasons. Why would you opt in? I mean, basically, I'm being profiled every time I breathe. Why would I opt in? What if I tell you that they'll, they'll um, you know, Insurance companies will gather your, the speed you're driving. So if you drive five miles less, five miles an hour less, if you use your signal when you turn, if you brake less harshly on your brakes, I'm going to give you $100 discount on your insurance bill. Would you do it? Yeah, maybe. Why not? Mm -hmm. Slash $100 of my insurance bill. So yes, they can give incentives for cus to customers to drive more safely. <laughs> And it depends on age. It depends on age. <laughs> Older people, not so much. Yes. You know, in fact, it's very interesting. That is a very good point because uh, the millennia and Generation Z are more amenable to sharing, which is very interesting. So yes, it is working with the new generation. I mean, yeah, I share information with you. Why not? I mean, anyway, I'm sharing all my life on Facebook. You know, I might just as well get $100 of my insurance bill. So yes, and this is what's allowing this. Of course, you know, the, the, the challenges are 
are we going to do something about our privacy? And they're claiming that their privacy policies are better than before. So we, we, we still have to know about this. But I don't think millenn millennials and Generation Z people mind it, honestly. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So to summarize so far what we have, we can say that what is business analytics? A definition for it would be it's a discipline that allows you to identify the need for change and to facilitate it. That would be a nice definition for business analytics. And business analysts are, dry, are agents for change. So basically, they are uh, involved with every layer of the organization. They drive strategy. They are um, involved with um, uh, goal setting. They're involved with building the enterprise architecture. And they are involved with continuous improvement. This is what a business analyst does. It's no more that programmer who sits in a room all you know, scramble with the data. They have to be involved with strategy. They have to be part of decision making. So yeah, we, we did talk about operational excellence, competitive agility, um, you know, anything related basically to business and making money. And you need that in an, any area that you, have, you, you are involved with. All right, so now to the deal meat of things. So in Pamplin, um, our faculty are not just involved with teaching. So we're very passionate about teaching and uh, getting our students to change the world, just like Faison is doing with basketball. Um, we are also, we conduct research. And you can expect that as you increase the sophistication of your model, you're going to increase the value you get out of it. So the first level, descriptive analytics, is basically metrics and looking at the data and visualizing it and understanding some trends, identifying some patterns. That's about it. So basically Excel kind of thing. But Excel is more powerful than you, you think. Uh, but you know, you can just visualize data and have average, mean, all the statistics. This is descriptive analytics. You move to the second level, uh, diagnostic uh, analytics. So basically you identify the root cause of the problem. That is what diagnosis. You diagnose the issue. What happened? Why did it happen? That's the root cause. Uh, so it might be that, um, you know, I'll talk to you a little bit later about a project I did with Karelian Clinic. They have overcrowding, and we identified the root cause of the issue. Why did overcrowding happen? I'm going to leave it to later to increase the suspense here. And then we move to the second one, uh, the third one, the predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is forecasting the future based on the past. So what do you think is going to happen next? That kind of thing. That's predictive analytics. Prescriptive is the best option for you. So if you're driving uh, and you want to figure out the fastest route, that's kind of prescriptive analytics. It takes into account in, in the business arena. It, gets, it takes into account your specific business the constraints you face, and gives you the best decision based on that. So yes, choose that route because traffic is like this. That is prescriptive analytics. But in reality, this is not all of it. Nowadays, you want to have make sure that you have embedded analytics. What does it mean, embedded analytics? You want to give people the best option they have when they need it without them knowing that you're giving them that. That's embedded. It's basically embedded in life without you even knowing that. And um, this is very interesting, actually, when you, when you dig into it, how you can use all the information around you to make the, better, to make the per, per people's life better, basically. Um, so. All right. So the first, um, you know, as I mentioned, we do a lot of heavy research, heavy meaning, you know, um, that allows us in Pamplin to be ranked higher as far as research from an academic perspective. So from the perspective of the academy, you need to publish in certain journals, and we are uh, ranked very highly in, in Pamplin. So this first um, 
project is actually uh, a project that did cost money to get the data from. We had to hire a marketing firm because we needed a sample that is encompassing of a lot of industries and we needed a sample that, you know, an actual organizational sample. So we did have to pay money for the data. It wasn't all free. But the insights we got from these projects were very important. So, you know, um, all businesses face a cyber loafing problem. What's a cyber, what cyber loafing? Does anybody know what cyber loafing is? You, you guys, some of you are cyber loafing right now in, in the lecture. So basically using, uh, surfing the internet during, inter during uh, normal work hours. Um, or, you know, internet related activities. So it could be your smartphone. It doesn't have to be a computer. So anything that is not work related using technologies, that's cyber loafing. And we knew that organizational, so formal organizational controls are policies. So the, we wanted to know whether policies, you know, when policies are announced, it changed anything in the behavior of cyber loafers, whether they, you know, decrease the cyber loafing and what is driving that. So we knew, we had an idea that, of course, if you put a policy against cyber loafing, people will tend to not cyber loaf. Right? But we wanted to know what is driving cyber loafing. Why do people cyber loaf in the first place? Why does it happen? And what is the, whether the announcement of controls would actually change the psychological process that is driving people to cyber loaf. Now you tell me, why is this topic so important? Well, it, it had been related to a lot of uh, losses of bandwidth, but also to lawsuits. So if your coworker is watching something that is offensive to you, that's a potential lawsuit for the business. So it has more implications than just money. You know, direct money, at least, direct cause. So we went back to theory. Part of the research that we do is that we always look at the theory. So the theory we uh, went back to is the criminologist theory. So we went to Akers, who's a criminologist. He studies criminal behavior or deviant behavior. Now you tell me, is really cyber loafing deviant? Yes, it is. You know, it is because you're not supposed to do it. You know you're not supposed to do it, and you still do it. Um, so we found that there are four drivers, according to uh, Aker's theory. If you were deviant in the past, chances are you will still be deviant in the future. And that is, you know, the past. Uh, it will, your pa the divine behavior will perpetuate. It's expected to continue. Unless there's something to prevent it, of course. It's contagious. If you're doing it and you're get, not getting punished for it, Gretchen, I'm going to do it too. Why not? Uh, risk is important. But we're not talking about risk that is bec uh, attached to the, uh, you know, to the policy. It's perceived risk. So I could be more risk averse than you. You know, I could just feel that something is not right more than you do. Some people are risk averse. Some people are risk lovers. They just love the thrill, I guess. Mm -hmm. And some people are risk neutral. So there are people with different uh, risk, uh, uh, exactly. And lastly, the last uh, one is neutralization. You neutralize your guilt. You know what? I'm going to cyber loaf because they didn't pay me well. They deserve it. Or I'm going to cyber loaf because later when I go home, I'm going to continue and finish my work. This is neutralization or justification of your actions. So we found something that's very interesting. We found that without formal controls, there might be perceived risk. But it's not going to affect the behavior. You're not going to change your behavior. You're just going to feel you know, weird but you're not going to actually decrease your cyber loaf. You're going to keep doing it because they didn't tell you it's wrong. They didn't tell you it's forbidden specific, you know, ex explicitly. But the other thing we found is that if you put formal controls, if you announce a cyber loafing policy, people will feel very angry because you changed something that they had before and they would want to retaliate. So what do you do about it? You make sure that you offer them education. You make sure they know why you did it and what's the effect of it, and teach them through scenario-based exercises. So we found that the scenario-based exercises were good because they actually make you live through it, you know, and understand what's going on. So this is one of the research, you know, that we did. This was an expensive one. 
because it took uh, two and a half years to get published. This one here is very interesting. It has a direct application to Virginia. So Karenian Clinic is a level uh, one trauma center, and it's the only level one trauma center in the Southwest Virginia region. What does it mean? It means that they get a lot of traffic, basically, and they suffer from overcrowding. Overcrowding is a big problem in, in Karenia. So basically, Whatever the crisis is, I mean, it could be that uh, there's a, a, an influenza epidemic, or it could be that there's a trailer crash. Whatever the cost of it, overcrowding happens. Basically, they have too many people. They can't serve too many patients. So we came up with a very interesting measure. So um, emergency departments collect data. Uh, it's called the NEDOC score. The NEDOC score is an emergency uh, indicator and it includes um, you know in the measure of it it includes the number of emergency de uh, department beds the number of patients who were admitted the number of patients who are in beds already the number of staff who transport the patients from the waiting room to the triage the number of staff who uh, transport the pat patients from the triage to the actual inpatient setting so a lot of you know uh, different components, but they didn't know what really was affecting. What was the bottleneck? They couldn't pinpoint it. They just had these data. That's it. That's all they had. Free data sitting in their computers. They didn't know what to do with it. They're really good at making us feel better medically, but they had no idea how to decrease overcrowding. They needed somebody to analyze the data. And the data pretty much looked like this. I mean, if you can make sense out of it, they couldn't. So they called upon us, and they only gave us one month of data, only one month. And the reason is we had to spend a whole semester, basically. You know, pretty much my PhD student spent a whole semester just to be able to get permission to get a hold of that May uh, 2016 mo uh, months. That's all we got. But our techniques were so powerful that we were able to make a big impact for them. We were able to identify the specific root cause of the problem. And the root cause was they didn't have enough staff that was transporting the patients from the waiting room to the triage. That's all. The other thing we were able, so we, we developed two models for them. That's the first model. The second model, because the data set was small, the confidence wasn't high very high, so it was only 80%. But basically, our model can predict within six hours of when overcrowding will happen. So they have some you know, warning. Hey, by the way, these are indicators. Be ready. Get more staff. Call, call them in. So this is how powerful business analytics is. We did this. Our student did this. And he got it published in a very, very good journal. All right, so in addition to teaching our students and getting them to change the world and uh, to doing research. We also teach in the Masters of Information Technology program. I personally teach the healthcare IT course. It's a healthcare analytics course. And if you don't know what the MIT program is, it's the uh, number three um, Masters of Information Technology fully online program that Pamplin and Engineering collaborate in. So that could be your future path, Jack. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know that it is uh, very well received. Um, there was an article in Seattle Times about my course recently. I was very excited because uh, um, you know, I didn't expect Seattle to know about the MIT. But yes, we, our students are from the West Coast. A lot of them are, a lot of them are international. I had students from uh, the United Kingdom last year. Um, so from all over, because it's a very well-recognized program. Before closing, I want to leave you with a message. Business analytics is about people. If you don't take people into consideration, you're not really a good business analyst. So people are at the center of business analytics, you need to consider the the, you need to personalize your models to make sure that you are serving the people, you know, and 
And basically, how do you personalize business analytics? You add artificial intelligence. So with artificial intelligence, what happens is you, uh, you basically get information about what's really going on in the real world. And then you take that data and you put it back in the sample. And you start with that new sample. So it's a combination of business analytics and artificial intelligence. But basically, the message is that don't forget the people. They're at the center of what we do today. Any questions? Any ideas, any insights? Yes, please. Is there any correlation co between cyber warfare and cyber security or cyber insecurity? Yes, sir, yes. So that is a very good question, actually, because uh, since you mentioned that, I forgot to tell you that we also have, uh, we are very well ranked in cyber security in Northern Virginia, Pamplin specifically. But yes, there is definitely a correlation. So. If you cyber loaf, you know, that is a behavioral issue. But if you don't have the right controls installed, that's a cyber security issue. So if I am cyber loafing in a way that I'm accessing websites I'm sh I sh shouldn't be accessing, or I'm clicking on emails that are spam, or that is a cyber security question. So cyber security are the controls underneath. But it is very important when you design a cyber security, a, a model, a security technology or a security process to take into account that people's behavior are not going to be the right. I mean, they're going to cyber love, they're going to do a lot of bad things and, you know, on the computers and you need to be ready for that. So yes, the stronger your cyber security, the less you'll be vulnerable to cyber loafing. Any other questions? Yes, please. A comment. My husband and I have spent a lot of time with cadets, with this happening in the And I have just been amazed in the last four years how many of those cadets that we interact with, when I ask, what are you measuring? Big. It took me a while. Thank you, and it's great to, uh, to know that. Uh, yes, business information technology is interesting. But, you know, so business information technology, when we have students majoring in BIT, they also could be ma other majors. So they double majors or they have dual degrees, and it could be marketing, um, hospitality and tourism management, accounting. Um, would you like to add something, Robert? On that? Uh, no, uh, the, the BIT degree, as you say, <laughs> is uh, the second largest yeah. major on campus, and it's growing very rapidly. Um, I, I think Laura's right. It, it, it fits well with that idea of spanning across disciplines and the BT-shaped student that uh, President Sands often talks about. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good vehicle for getting at the people side problems, as Laura was suggesting at the end of the talk. So, I'm glad you're hearing that from the core members. Thank you for mentioning that. So uh, uh, this is us. This is Pamplin. Um, we come from different disciplines. You know, many of us are engineers. Many of us mm -hmm. have that background. And because of that, I think this is what makes us who we are. I mean, I couldn't imagine myself without the engineering background I had. It's in, it's in me somewhere. Without my finance background, you know, we uh, basically, um, are a package, and the more we learn, the more we can give. I learned the most when I started teaching, because this is when you actually, oh, you know, maybe I'm not right, let me go check. Oh, maybe there's something new I need to, to check. So teaching is a continuous learning experience for us, and I love it. I love it, and even though I'm in this role, and this role, I, I love my current role, because the, uh, it's all about the students. Basically, I make sure that we recruit them, from the day we recruit them, to the day we say bye, and then afterwards, as you alums, we take care of them. And I love that aspect of things. Yes, sir. One opinion question. Sure. Is sharing data going to make us more secure or less secure? So that is a very good point. Now, there's a difference between security and privacy. What's the difference? Security is about technology, the safeguards you have in place. Privacy is a different issue. So I could, be, I could put you, so when you log in into your bank system, they ask you some questions. That's uh, 
knowledge-based authentication. Do you think this is private? So you're basically sharing data about yourself. What's your pet's name? What's your mom's middle name? You know, all of these are private issues. They're doing it for security reasons. So they're increasing security by de but decreasing your privacy. So that's a trade-off. Yes, you in sometimes increase security, but at the um, expense of privacy. So um, sharing will never make you more secure. That you know, will never make you more private. The more I share about myself, the less private I feel. You know, I, the more exposed I'll, I'll feel. So we're going to have to figure out what to do with these things. Uh, there is a, a propensity of the new generation to not really care. I mean, all their life is online. Um, and basically, what, what companies are doing, they're leveraging that for their benefit. They're selling our data because of it. So. I won't do it myself, but maybe my son will. I'm expecting he would. Well, that's a great question. Yes, sir. At what point do you begin to prevaricate in situations of that nature to protect yourself? Uh, I think what happens is usually there's um, a problem. You fall into an issue. Somebody sees your identity, uh, and you start retracting, or um, you know. So, it's, it's a very hairy issue. I mean, everybody's tweeting. Everybody's uh, putting their pictures online. And I'm guessing um, it's very, you know, it's very, I wouldn't do much online because, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm an old person, I guess. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, older generations, I mean, we are always um, careful about what, you know, what we put, but uh, the new generation doesn't care. I don't think they do care as much as we do. But there are still identity thefts. I mean, people are stealing information ongoing. This, it's even an increasing problem. It's not, you know, cybersecurity is a big uh, domain for Pamplin as well. Um, so we can talk more about it uh, on the side. Yes? So you think that means it's more dangerous or we should protect the younger children from being exposed earlier and restrict that more than more than it, it is it is mm -hmm. it is to to see you know whether it has any behavioral uh, we can make any behavioral changes at this point I think they're so embedded in um, the new hypes that it's hard for us to change their behavior however we can be smarter about our technologies, about our cybersecurity, and about our privacy laws. You know, so yes, GM wants to sell our data. They better pay for it in some way or shape. So we're still in the process of figuring out the, you know, the backbone of all this. Yes, but you know, but we're talking about you know elections. We're talking about really high level and inf uh, you know influential stuff that have impact on our life and it is a, a threat it's an ongoing threat so does that mean the information would be more skewed to a younger generation versus the elder that doesn't necessarily use it as much so depending on what kind of information it is yes so um so I guess data that is not out there will not be exposed. I mean, it's only data that they can have access to. But you know, uh, you use your your uh, iPhone, you use your smartphone. You know, you have to, right? The um, uh, fingerprints, the you know, all of this is just making you feel better. But uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, yes. Just a content question. Do, do your classes talk anything about 256-bit uh, encryption versus the coming revolution with quantum computing and breaking out the rhythm, traditional algorithms? It'll, it'll definitely, I mean, we are move, moving toward artificial intelligence. We are moving toward quantum computing. We are getting better at cybersecurity. But privacy is still, you know, privacy is not necessarily related to what we're trying to do. So wh whatever information you share with, you know, like when I share information about myself with my bank, with, um, you know, if you do your taxes with H&R Block and they 
uh, ask you to upload your um, information to their website. I mean, the information is out there. So I don't feel private, you know. You're private when you don't use the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> And who, who can do that? I mean, you still have to function in today's society. It's very hard to do that. Thank you guys so much. I mean, I really enjoyed this. I hope you get another chance. Thank you. Thank you.